Good evening. Um, thanks for joining us tonight uh, for this edition of Not the Museum Thursday Night, our ongoing effort to um, provide quality and great programming from the museums here at the City of Niagara Falls. Um, the, uh, we're very excited tonight to bring you tonight's webinar with two people that I respect and have, have had the pleasure to work bo with both of them in the past and have benefited from their knowledge and their abilities. Um, but before I get started, I'd like to acknowledge that the Niagara region of Ontario is located on the traditional shared territory of the Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, and Chinookton peoples. The Chinookton people have called these lands home for thousands of years, and more recently, the Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee have been sharing the land as one dish, one spoon treaty territory. My name is Clark Burnett, and I'm the Culture and Museums Manager for the City of Niagara Falls, and very happy to bring you tonight's program. Um, so a bit about tonight's program and why I thought it might be interesting. Um, most of us have been to forts, we've driven past them, taken tours, watched reenactments. Uh, they're about 25 kilometers apart, I believe. Uh, I was in the promo, so if I get that wrong, check there. Um, you know, they're, they, they, they bookend in many ways the Niagara River. Um, they, we've watched reenactments, there's fireworks or concerts at them. Um, they're large spaces and these two properties are probably the largest and at least, at least physically the largest uh, historic sites we have in this uh, region. Uh, they tell us about the past and also about how we recognize um, our history and what we do preserve. Uh, these two that we have here tonight with us work at sites to tell a story that goes way deeper than just the battles and soldiers. Um, they're home to many, many people beyond the soldiers, beyond the cannons and the muskets. They really do connect us with what Niagara was like 200 years ago, the people, the places, the stories. Um, these sites that, as they continue to operate, allow this to happen. And I'm sure we uh, could have dedicated a full webinar to each of them, and maybe we will in the future. Um, but I want to start with, you know, looking at both of these and have a bit of a casual chat. Um, and, and who knows, maybe end up with a battle of Fort Smackdown, who knows, um, emails going between these two because they know each other really well uh, have been great. And uh, um, we'll see how it goes and, and hope you enjoy it. Uh, I will say, bear with me. I'm sort of manning all the controls tonight. So I'm gonna do the best I can to check questions. I'm gonna try and moderate the conversation and the discussion, um, and also look at all the technical aspects. They know their history, they know their sites, they know the War of 1812 really well. So you've got them here, we've got them for about 45 minutes. So um, check it out and see how it's going. If you have questions, there is a Q&A feature in Zoom um, that we want you to use. We want you to use the Q&A function. And I'll try and ask questions along the way and try to take some breaks to review. Uh, and feel, fr feel free to ask these guys uh, some questions. There's also a chat feature and I won't be checking that for questions but please utilize if you wish. Um, and if you're joining us on Facebook Live, I'll give it a shot to look for questions, but I'm not promising anything. Um, maybe we'll try and circle back there uh, later on and answer some questions as well, or hopefully we may answer it along the way. But like I said, one man sort of tech crew, and I know you can only do so much without screwing everything up. So um, just so hopefully you're following along and enjoy it as well from there as well. So. Um, like I said, if there's questions, put them in the, the Q&A and we'll try and get that. So on to tonight, and I have two much more interesting people to do all the talking uh, tonight. We are very fortunate to have many sites around uh, the area, as I mentioned, but two of the most physical and, and certainly the most largest are Fort Erie and Fort George. Um, you know, who knows, this might end up as a battle of forts, wood versus stone, large versus small, uh, view of Youngstown versus Buffalo. Who knows where it's going to go, but uh, I am happy to have these two gentlemen with us. Uh, the first, and I'll try and bring him into the conversation. We'll try, actually, we'll ask both of them to unmute, and, uh, and I'll try and make their, you know, open up their videos and all that other stuff. And uh, again, technical aspects, here's what I'm working on. Start video. And start video. So you guys are sort of asked to come on in. So Travis Hill is the first that I'm going to sort of ask him in. He's not quite joined us yet. He's not the, uh, the gentleman there, but uh, there's Travis. So Travis has been with Old Fort Erie since 2001, starting as a Storks interpreter. 
He's organized and facilitated numerous educational programs, reenactments, and commemorative services at this National Historic Site over the past several years, and rose to his current role as a site manager. Uh, Trevor is Tuscarora of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy and resides in Fort Erie, Ontario. Uh, the other gentleman we have with us is Peter Martin, he came to Parks Canada in 2009 uh, at the Fort George National Historic Site as the Military Animation Coordinator. Uh, prior to this, Peter was employed to Old Fort Erie, uh, part of the Parks Commission for 16 years with the last four years as General Manager. And from 2010 to 11, he was Acting Site Supervisor responsible for the daily operations and special events for Fort George National Historic Site. Uh, in 2011, and he's got a long bio and it's gonna take a long time, uh, but, it's, <laughs> um, but uh, he helped tremendously during the War of 1812 and the Bicentennial, uh, was very active in coordinating a lot of the events going on in the area. And he's currently the product development officer with a focus on special events at National Historic Sites across Southwestern Ontario. He is an avid musician and has toured throughout North America and now performs records locally in the Niagara region. So gentlemen, thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All, right. All right, thanks guys. And, uh, and, and Travis mentioned as well that Peter was his uh, sort of, he learned a lot of Fort George from Peter. So uh, um, we'll see how much uh, Peter forgot about Fort Erie and, uh, <laughs> and how much Travis now knows more than him. So. So we'll get into that a little bit. So, so uh, you know, I, I think for the people at home, we sort of thought, let's go through it a bit of chronologically, look at these sites, um, look at how they sort of evolved and how they, how they changed um, and sort of do it chronologically and uh, uh, sort of walk people through this and we'll bounce back and forth. But, you know, let's, let's, let's talk about the construction of these forts. Like, like, what were they doing here? Like, like why, you know, obviously why are they in where they are? Where, why did the, uh, uh, get placed where they were, who was putting them, how to get constructed, sort of, let's sort of do the nuts and bolts of sort of the, the actual construction and the establishment of forts at both ends of the river. So maybe Peter, start with you, sort of how, uh, you know, how did Fort George uh, evolve and, and come about? Sure, well, um, Fort, to, to kind of uh, to talk about Fort George and its construction, you kind of have to go uh, back a little further uh, and, uh, uh, answer the question of why so many forts in general built along the Niagara River, right? You've got Fort Erie, Fort George, Fort Slosser, uh, Black Rock, Fort Niagara, you've got all these forts. And uh, of course the answer is the Niagara River, that that's why they built them to protect the river because as we all know, the river was, primary function was the exportation of buffalo chicken wings to the rest of North America. But, <laughs> kidding, but uh, no, it's the major supply route, right? From the St. Lawrence Seaway heading west you know, everything comes through a small strait, right? So we have, so that's why it was, it was such a, a need to protect it. And Fort Niagara, of course, being one of the first forts built um, by the French originally in the early 1700s. Uh, of course, it gets handed over to the British um, after the Seven Years' War. Um, and it was at that time where, where the idea of a, a Fort George really starts to evolve, uh, that Gautermont actually came up with an idea of for, a fort on the uh, other side of the river as kind of a secondary defense position, mm -hmm. right? But not really defensive for it, more for like supplies and that kind of stuff, right? So it wasn't until after the, um, uh, the American Revolution happens that the British now have to move to the now, you know, British side of North America, British side of the river. And, uh, and with the, um, uh, of course in 1791 with the establishment of Upper Canada and uh, Newark becoming the capital, you know, kind of thing. Land is set aside at that point for the, the, the construction of Fort George. And it wasn't really until um, after the Jays Treaty is ratified and finally signed that uh, in, in the late 1790s, 1796, is that Fort George has actually started to be built. So uh, one of the common questions we have asked is why is it there? Of all the places, like the mouth of the river seems to be more the logical place. And like, why is it so far down? Obviously, Fort Niagara commands the mouth of the river at Lake Ontario. Uh, why was it built there? And it, the number one question we often have asked is, so, so it's made of wood. And it's, yeah, it's like, Fort Niagara is stone. Yes. Can they hit each other with cannons? Yes. Did they hear about the three little pigs or, you know, like bricks, sticks, like why? Did they, did they, did they make it of, of, uh, of wood? And the answer, of course, is uh, uh, mostly t time 
is one of them. And it wasn't supposed to be a permanent fortification when it was first built. Uh, they had a much bigger plan to build a fort more on the mouth of the river itself, which eventually becomes Fort Mississauga. Um, but uh, so this was kind of a temporary structure. So they start building it. And uh, by about um, 1802, it's, it's finally finished, well, for the most part. Um, but again, wood versus stone. Um, you look at, you know, Fort Erie compared to Fort George, uh, you know, in, in just over five years, they got Fort George built of wood, whereas I believe Fort Erie Trav, a fort that's, you know, one third the size of Fort George, after 12 years still wasn't done. <laughs> right? Right? So a stone fort takes a lot longer to build than, than a wood fort. So you gotta be sure of where you're putting it too. Yeah. And of course, you know, the Americans had to finish your fort for you, you know, so, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, so, so that's, that's kind of the why Fort George kind of uh, looks the way it does where it's located uh, predominantly uh, why it's so farther down the river is if you look at the map that you're, you're showing right now, you'll see that uh, right below the fort along the water is a Navy Hall wharfing facility. And uh, that's where the dock was for almost all the ships coming in to unload all their supplies. So the need was to protect that, uh, to protect their supplies and their ships coming in that would dock there. So they literally built it right on top of, right. uh, of, of uh, Navy Hall. And they did elevate it because they realized that Fort Niagara was right there. Right, and it was a wood fort with a lot of earthen walls. So they did elevate it about 11 to 14 feet higher, depending on where you are on the fort, um, than Fort Niagara. So the idea was the guns of Fort Niagara couldn't actually get inside Fort George. They would hit the earthen wall and skip off. Now, of course, later on, the Americans remedied that by building gun batteries along the Niagara River that were <laughs> elevated, you know, so. But, uh, but that's why it was, it was located um, uh, where, it, where it is today. So uh, if you go to the next slide, uh, uh, Clark. If I do it the right way. There we go. There you go. So that's essentially what, what is built in 1802. This is the 1802 map. And uh, if you'll notice that if you've been to Fort George, it's very, very close to what the fort looks like today. Um, the only difference really uh, is that you'll notice there's four smaller buildings out in front of the main blockhouse there uh, toward the middle of the screen. And they're no longer there, but those were just temporary, like like mess buildings, essentially, or, or mess areas that uh, that got burned down quite a bit, actually. So, <laughs> so those are the only parts that aren't actually there anymore. But um, but it gives you a good idea of what the fort looked like at 1802. One interesting thing about Fort George is that the the the, the bastion located called labeled as Prescott's Bastion on the map currently being shown. Uh, normally, your bastions, so the, a six pointed bastion for vacation, would be symmetrical. Uh, to eliminate uh, crossfire positions, right? So there's no blind spots anywhere. And you'll notice that Prescott's Bastion is askew. Uh, it's not dead center. And that's because you'll notice that at the bottom, there's a gully actually that ran through and they couldn't build the Bastion dead center. So they had to move it off slowly to the, uh, to the well, right on your map or left if you're looking at it inside the fort. Um, which does mean there is actually one small blind spot. A fort chart that <laughs> literally a soldier could kind of, you know, do this and no one could <laughs> shoot them, but, you know. The small blind spot. That's that's pretty much it for that. And then the next image uh, that you have there is uh, the, the famous Walsh print. Yeah. And of course, uh, um, Walsh was a surgeon in the 49th Regiment of Foot, who was in Canada from 1803 to 1806. And he does film, or uh, film, he does paint, <laughs> excuse me, a lot of uh, uh, really great images of Niagara during this time period. Yeah. Some of the best um, for sure. Yeah. And you can see the, you know, you can see the, the officer's quarters there in, in the, in the in right dead center with the, um, uh, the guardhouse off the right. So it's a little different than it looks now. The color's the same as what we have in the fence. Uh, the peaks over the doors are a bit different. And of course, another reason why Fort George is so much cooler than Fort Erie is that we had a pet bear, you know? <laughs> so of course we got the bear. And I knew about a bear. There's two in this photo, right? But it was just one. I believe Walsh, Walsh always painted himself in his, his paintings. Yeah. So I yeah, believe that's him that is, there, right? yeah, he's there. That's him right there. And uh, he also, I think that is a bear in that one. He always has his dogs with them. He paint when he paints him and his dogs, right, right, that's right. they're in every painting. So you can see his dogs kind of lying on the ground there. So you see the two, the two bears uh, there in the picture. So another interesting, uh, cool thing about Fort George, but, but yeah, so that's kind of leading up to the, so, that's kind of the, the, the short version of why right. it's there and, and uh, what it kind of looked like at the time. So, so, okay. So Travis, over to you. So Fort Erie, we got the Fort George, we got the Northern section dealt with. 
um, and looking at sort of uh, leaving from Fort uh, Niagara and, and providing a new defense after the, um, after the American Revolution. What's Fort Erie's story? Uh, well, we are upriver from Fort, from Fort George, so everybody knows when you're upriver, but rows downhill, right? Um <laughs> <laughs> uh, so and it was built in the 1760s. The fort that you're actually looking at um, is a reconstruction of the fort that was used during the War of 1812. Um, the original one was actually built down by where you actually see the parking lot. Mm -hmm. that, that's where the original one was built. And we've had Wilfred Laurier do archeological digs uh, down at that parking lot to find the original structure of the buildings that were down there. And they were successful. So there is evidence and archeological evidence stating that uh, we are the first British built fort in Ontario, built down at that parking lot. And <laughs> the one that you actually look at and the one that you visit today is the one that was used during the War of 1812. And the one that we actually take you through on the tour is the one that uh, it's built on the original foundations. It, there is original uh, part of the buildings that still exist today that we'll point out to you. Um, and that is the, it's an amalgamation of British and American because it was built by the British and it was kind of finished by the Americans. Uh, during the War of 1812. And even during the Siege of Fort Erie, we'll get into this probably later, but during the Siege of Fort Erie, it was like expanded to even what you visit today. Right, right. So, okay, so let me know. So Fort Erie is facing Buffalo, obviously. Yeah, it's a much wider, the river's much wider there. So what were they, what were they setting up here versus Fort George? Like, uh, was there any theory as to why, they, or is this British built forts this way everywhere and Fort Erie happened to be the location? It, well, yeah, and you, you have to consider like uh, every mouth of every river and every entrance of a uh, river, like the, there's the protection, right? Right. So um, Fort Erie was built out of Pontiac's Rebellion in 1763. So that's when the original fort was built down by that parking lot was right. in 1763, was out of Pontiac's Rebellion. Right, right, right. Okay. So, and, and so at that point, it's military purpose, probably trading post as well, I presume, uh, stopover for people going up up and back and back through the Great Lakes. Yeah. That's sort of its role. And it's almost the yin and yang with Fort Niagara. Fort Niagara was built on the American side, but it didn't matter at this time because the British controlled both. Yeah, and like everything I've read about like a Fort Erie, it was just a horrible outpost to be posted at. <laughs> there was a, a, like a small garrison uh, <laughs> occupied the fort, um, like 15 to 25 soldiers. It was a, a very small garrison. And yeah, it was a, like a stopping point for ships to stop there and move on. Right. And I have to imagine just by logic that he didn't want to stay there more than one night. Right. Um, and that, yeah, and that was exactly what it was used as. And over time, I mean, obviously, its uh, predominance and its history came from came out of uh, the War of 1812. Right, right. And so, okay, so what's over in Buffalo at this point? What's, what's across the river? Is there anything going on over there at this point? Uh, in the 1760s, no, there wasn't really a major threat. Um, and uh, yeah, there really wasn't a major threat. No, no, no major establishment. Of them. Okay, yeah, cool. Okay, so so both of these sort of um, um, go into it. They're a bit of a response to to the war. So so during the war, so what kind of size are we looking at? What what uh, you know what's on site? What are we looking at? Like who's you know maybe Travis, you start us off. Who's living here just before the war of eighteen twelve? Before work breaks out, you know how many people we do have on this site, and is there? There, there are women and families here, or is it predominantly a post uh, uh, that people get shipped to and, and uh, you know, they're stuck there? Or sort of what's the composition, you know, just before the War of 1812? There were uh, a small civilian post. There was uh, a, a black community that was north of Fort Erie uh, that was that, that like amalgamated. 
uh, it was a major stopping point for the Underground Railroad. So there was uh, that, that civilian uh, aspect that was outside of Fort Erie. Mm -hmm. But like any other fort, and just like Fort George, the uh, communities started around the forts um, because mm -hmm. of protection. So right. before the War of 1812, uh, there was a small community in terms of the population. It wasn't that big. Uh, most of the soldiers that were stationed here, uh, like I mentioned before, <laughs> probably didn't want to be here. Um, yeah, so that, that, that was the face of the community at this point. Right, right. Pete, what about, you know, Fort, Fort George? Sort of the same type of thing? Well, Fort George, as I said earlier, right, you, you've got a, a in, it, before Fort George actually is built, uh, Newark is named the capital of Upper Canada, right? So there was an establishment there. Uh, so you can imagine it was a, it was kind of a, a becoming a happening place. Um, with, with Fort George being built, it does grow. Um, you've got, uh, it's, it's by 1812, it's actually the, um, the headquarters for the Senate Division of the British Army in all of Canada, mm. right? So it's, it's an important place. You've got Major General Isaac Brock now, uh, coming over and, and, and being there and commanding there and Shafe and those guys. Um, it's also um, uh, the depot for the British Indian Department, right? Uh, originally located on the bottoms in front of Fort Niagara that now, because it's now British North America, they move over and the Indian Council House is built. And in some cases you have hundreds if not thousands of First Nations warriors gathering on the property. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a happen in place. There's lots going on. Um, so by the time the War of 1812 breaks out, um, there's, I believe at, at its height, uh, it has about 1,400 troops stationed uh, at Fort George with a variety of, of you know, regiments and militia and First Nations and, and so on and so forth. So, it, so it's, it's a pretty, pretty, pretty happening place, if you want to say that, as opposed to mm -hmm. Fort Erie. Like, what, how do you, working at Fort Erie, Travis is right. It was, it was an outpost and it was not a desirable <laughs> place to be you, you'd much be rather at fort george depending on when you're there though right you have shafe showing up swing it swinging up pigeons i love that picture swing yeah pigeons. swing up pigeons yeah yeah that's so great. I love that picture too. <laughs> but for a soldier right you have shafe showing up and um i i don't know how many people are aware of the the mutiny and the mass desertion that happens when shafe comes on onto fort george takes a man while brock's at york you know, Shave shows up. He was a strict disciplinarian. <laughs> he was, he was, you know, he, he was, was a drill punish, sergeant. Yeah. Oh, he was punishing guys for like, you know, you got a button missing, you get lashed with a cat of ninth. Like it was just awful. And uh, Brock comes and becoming they're so close to the border, desertion was relatively easy, mm -hmm. right? They could just get away quickly. So mm -hmm. there's this this mass desertion and, and mu attempted mutiny that's quelled by uh, Brock, who comes in right. and kind of says to Shave, "This is in England. You know, you gotta you gotta reel it in. You know, kind of thing." Right. So. But, so, uh, and, and that's right. That's so, so again, and, and I've told both these guys and for those at home, I know Fort George a little bit better than Fort Erie. Like, but, but, you know, Tra uh, Travis, who's in charge of Fort Erie at this, like, like just before the war or even, even leading up to it. Like, you know, you talk about Brock and Schaaf and some of these major generals, uh, like, like is Fort Erie so much of an outpost is sort of just way down the chain of command of who's in charge of these spaces. <laughs> Well, it was, it was so small, like, uh, and when you visit this, when you visit us, we have an officer's quarters that was just, that we had, uh, like, low-ranking officers that were stationed here, so, mm -hmm. like, the, the highest you would have is, like, a captain, where, right. not, where uh, at Fort George you would have, because it's so big and expansive, they can live the, the lifestyle that they're used to. Down here at Fort Erie, it was just a hard-nosed, uh right. they had the nice tea parties up there and all yeah, the social exactly. life and all that right yeah exactly in the hard weather if you had thicker skin you could uh <laughs> you, you, you right. could... just like now right 40 gets pounded in the winter and, uh... <laughs> yeah yeah and that's and that was the lifestyle like yeah during the war of 1812 and and so we only had like two or three officers that were stationed here they lived like in shared accommodations, which is something that they're not used to. Um, and it was a lifestyle that they weren't really used to, but if you go up to Fort George, yeah, you can sip from your silver teacup. You can <laughs> and you eat, eat fire food and race yeah. your horses around the race course. And you can have your, <laughs> yeah, you can have your cattle, you can have your pigs. <laughs> All that stuff. So, yeah. So, okay. So let's get into the war itself. So how does the war transform the fort? Maybe Travis sort of start with you. Um, you know, what changes happens to Fort Erie or, or sort of obviously, you know, let's talk about highlights. What, what, you know, the highlights, highlights or lowlights, depends on how you look at it. 
um, you know, of, of what impact the War of 1812 has on the fort? Uh, yeah, it exchanged hands multiple times throughout the, the War of 1812 and 1812 and 1813. The biggest impact it had was uh, in 1814 during the Niagara campaign. Uh, it was a tail end of that, and it was a culmination of the anger result. Um, two months siege was laid to our fort, and a lot of lives were lost. And there was multiple pe multiple people involved. So the interpretation that we tell is all sides of the story, and the reason why we tell that is because there was multiple lives that were lost from multiple angles. So we tell everybody's story that the Americans, the British, the indigenous warriors, the native warriors, uh, even though there was a small amount of them, but uh, all of them were involved in the siege of Fort Erie. And the two month siege that was laid to our place, um, it came from not even the property that we own. When you, when you come here, it's not even, it's a small fraction of the impact that it had on the community. Hmm. Um, so with that was pretty much like in a nutshell. Right. Again, if you're in siege mode there, you're, you're, you're going to the homes of the residents and getting food from them and all those things, right? They, yeah. You know, yeah. 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 You're, you're relying on the surroundings to sort of make sure they maintain all the military supplies. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and there was a lot of fear, right? There, there had a, a lot of fear that was uh, surrounding the community. And yeah, after two months of siege, uh, the fort blew up, exchanged hands, and it laid in remnants for a bunch of times, uh, for a bunch of years. And it, it was finally restored to the way it is today. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so Pete, maybe again, maybe it's just, you know, the, 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 the quick version of, you know, the War of 1812. Obviously, you know, um, both these forts get, you know, pummeled and, and changed. So, so, you know, maybe take us through the Fort George uh, 1812 story. Absolutely. And it, it's kind of interesting that, you know, uh, the camp, their campaigns, 1812, 1813, are Fort George, 1814 is Fort Erie. Like that's mm -hmm. kind of where the big things happen is that we're more at the beginning of the war and, and Fort Erie is more toward the end of the war. And 1812, of course, um, the main thing that happens is the Battle of Queenston Heights, obviously, right? That's, that's the, the highlight, or as you say, the low light, depending on how you look at it, mm -hmm. uh, of 1812 for Fort George being that, you know, and we could spend a whole webinar talking about the Battle of Queenston Heights alone, right? Mm -hmm. But um, of course, it's a, it's, it's a British victory, but at a heavy cost, being that Major General uh, Sergeant Brock uh, dies at the battle. And uh, him and, and uh, uh, Lieutenant Colonel McDonnell is actually interred at Fort George shortly after the battle. So the British win the battle, Fort George stays intact, it remains, and they're buried actually within the bastion of, of Fort George itself, which is still marked to this day uh, where he was. He's not there anymore, mind you, but. Uh, but that's a whole uh, other story. Yeah, a whole other story, whole other story. Mm -hmm. yeah. But uh, it's still marked there. Uh, but 1813 is when Fort George sees predominantly the, the bulk of the action, as it were. Um, in April, April 25th of 1813, the Americans take York, right? And they set their sights now um, on, on George. Um, and uh, the British know this. Uh, so a month later to the day um, is the bombardment of Fort George, where, um, a set, long story very short, um, American batteries open up in Fort George and pummel it with hot shot, with cannonballs, heat up glowing red hot. Mm. It's a wood fort, you know, <laughs> do the math, right? <laughs> uh, you know, so by, by, without getting into detail, by about 12 o'clock, the whole place is on fire, essentially. And uh, the British retreat further inland toward where Butler's barracks is. Um, and uh, Vincent prepares for the inevitable invasion, which comes two days later, uh, by splitting his men up, because he's not too sure where they're going to attack from which was, is good and bad, depending on how you look at it. Mm -hmm. uh, and then if you got that image on number four, I believe yep. that was in the PowerPoint, yep. um, it shows a, um, a print that was a modern print oh. that was done to represent uh, uh, the Battle of Fort George. And um, so oh, go the back print, one right? more. Yep. Yep. There you go. Yeah. So there, there's kind of an image of, of, of representation of the Battle of Fort And the wonderful little lighthouse. Yeah. Yeah. So um, the bulk of the action took place on the lakeside. Uh, Vincent didn't know if it was going to be on the river or the lake, but you got to keep in mind that, you know, the cannons along the river open fire in Fort George, keep the British confused and disoriented. And uh, there's just a, a representation of the battle. And if you go to the next slide, it shows you the numbers. Yeah, um, I love this. I love this uh, <laughs> you know, visual. 
so it's a good visual to represent the two sides of the uh, the Battle of Fort George and how completely outnumbered the British were uh, during this battle. Um, what's interesting about the battle is a few interesting things is that this is one of the first uh, combined amphibious uh, with, with naval artillery and infantry landing at the same time working in, in tandem, which is still taught at West Point today mm -hmm. um, for the, from the American perspective that the British guns kept the British, oh, sorry, American guns, excuse me, on the ships kept the British pinned down while their troops could land. And once the troops were on land, they would go out, the artillery would stop. And uh, the British managed to push them back about three times before eventually they're just completely overwhelmed and uh, have to retreat out of the area. So, right. uh, so let's just, and, and again, Travis, I'm going to put you on the spot here. And I, I love the visual of, you know, 1,400 soldiers at Fort George and 21 cannons. You know, uh, Fort Erie, again, in comparison, like how many soldiers are at Fort Erie sort of in its peak of time? Uh, during peacetime, it was small. During, oh, but I meant at peak, at, at peak sorry. At during peak, like, yeah, during the siege, it was uh, over 2,000 okay. that British that came down and uh, equal numbers on the American side. And that, yeah, this, this visual that Pete provided is almost equal to what uh, uh, Fort Erie saw. Okay, cool. Sorry, Pete, go on. Yeah, no problem. So, so yeah, so um, so it becomes an American comes an American fort after that, and perfect timing. Yeah. So the Americans, as you can see by the map, uh, changed the face of Fort George uh, uh, quite a bit. I love the historic highlighter on this one. Yeah, so the highlighter. <laughs> yeah. So uh, what's what? I'll get to that in a second. So the fort itself, as you can see, they essentially cut it in half, um, and there's a little bit of mix on what actually they they built, mm -hmm. um, how much buildings. Like some accounts say that the Americans did. There was a few buildings left they fixed. Others count say they built some temporary buildings. Some say they didn't build anything. So um, you gotta kind of take it for what it's worth uh, for what actually was built on the inside. Mm -hmm. uh, but they make it a lot smaller, which is much easier to defend. Actually, it looks a lot like Fort Erie. Uh, and they don't have to do as much because they've got Fort Niagara over the river. So they, they yeah. don't really need as much here, right? Exactly, right? So they built a trench line that runs along. Um, that's that blue highlighted. Mm -hmm. um, what I found interesting about that um, is that if you go to the next slide, which shows Fort Erie, that it looks very similar in design in that the fort off to the right, that's the British fort that was built and everything to the left wasn't, uh, wasn't built. That was mm -hmm. all added by the Americans. So if you look at the design from this slide back to the other one, the mm -hmm. layout is very similar, uh, making an area where you could house troops and you could put supplies and have some level of protection. Now for mm -hmm. Fort George, it was just a trench, so it wasn't too much, but for Fort Erie, no. it was a huge like bash the wall. And, and there's only a little bit of remnants of that trench in, in yes. our cemetery that I know of. Like it's pretty yep. shallow. Is that like it is. pretty true? Is that what we think? It was just a shallow. It's yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't that. It's, it's no. almost like a, a water ditch in, 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 in front of some of these houses. Yeah, it was probably a bit deeper than it is now, okay. but still yeah. wasn't like a World War One trench that was, right. you know, you know, right. huge. I know that's always the tough part of the interpretation. When you say trench, you're thinking World yeah, War One. Yeah, World War One. So, yeah, exactly. Or not that. So, yeah. So the Americans, of course, hold it until uh, December of 1813, and then they, they, they leave it. And of course, before they leave, um, they burn down the town before they go. Um, and then, of course, the British return. And in the winter of 1813, like a week later, uh, they take Fort Niagara in a sneak attack. Uh, and then they hold on to Fort Niagara. So if you go to the next slide, uh, two, two after that. All right. Okay. Oh, yeah. Uh, right there. So this is now the British version of Fort George. Uh, in 18, after 18, like 1814, essentially. Uh, but they have control of Fort Niagara now, right? right so right. they don't really need another Fort of Fort George anymore because they've got Fort Niagara. So from all accounts, this is essentially the plan, but what was actually built there wasn't much. Right, great. So, and what then 1814, case? everything shifts to Fort Erie. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, in the southern tier of Niagara, exactly. Yeah. 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 Um, and, and okay, so, so, Great overview, guys. I really appreciate that. I guess what I, and again, I'm, you guys know, like, like I go to, I go to you guys for military history, you know, that's not, never been my forte. I've always loved the stories of history. And I guess, you know, like, like Travis, is there any great stories of the people that are there or, or really the, th you know, something that people don't know about Fort Erie um, that, 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 that just fascinates you? <laughs> uh, oh yeah, there's multiple stories. Uh, I'll share... I'll share one. They're Pontiac and Butler, who were 
enemies actually shared a pipe at Fort Erie. And they, they, I, what they discussed, we have no idea. <laughs> but the fact that two enemies during uh, the 1760s shared something, like shared a pipe and smoked it, the discussion fascinates me. That is one, that is one story that like I uh, you can't can't dig into, right? Yeah, you just I, can't figure out how those two worlds collide. What what what's going on with those two? Yeah, it would be, yeah, it would be no yeah, it would be no different than like Brock and um, I don't know Porter, like during right. wartime, <laughs> like sitting there like having a discussion about like like adversary, adversaries enemies, like. During a time like when you're at war with somebody and you're able to have a discussion with them, like it's just something that fascinates me. Like two over three hundred years ago. Right, right, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, Pete, what about you? What's what's one of your sort of favorite little oh. nuggets? Well, there's so many. Um, you know, there's the infamous you know uh, declaration of war story with Brock dining with American officers when war is declared, and they say, "Well, not let this," you know news affect our evening and they carry on and have dinner and Americans go back and next day they're out war. There's this like that. Um, the two, there's, there's two I, I, kind of unique ones that may, mo- some people might not know that are actually closely related. And it's about the officers of the fort that um, in the eighties when they were, they were doing some work on, on Fort George, they discovered a pit behind uh, the officers quarters. And in the pit, they found the remnants of what looked like a dinner party it was, it was there's, there's Chinaware and there's glassware all smashed in a bag, along with a chamber pot and a, a cat. We're not too sure why. <laughs> and we have no idea what happened. Like, like there's been so many guesses about why like these dishes and like, like a full dish set, like plates and gravy boats and all these serving implements were all smashed in this like bag buried behind the officer's quarters. And it's like, what happened? Now, it might have had something to do with the 13 b- broken bottles they found for, <laughs> for the, like, five Again, back to that, that they had. social life of Fort George. Exactly, right? Because like, if, if an officer, a junior officer especially, got tagged with breaking a, a, a plate in the mess, you had to pay, pay it, like, threefold, right? So I'm, we're assuming that there was a party by some of the junior officers got a bit out of hand, and they tried to essentially bury the evidence. <laughs> So, right. But we have no idea, right? The cool thing about it, though, one, on, a, on the history nerd side of it, is that they also discovered the remnants of bones they had for dinner. So it gives you a good example of what they actually ate, you know, yeah. like for dinner, which is kind of yeah. neat when you think about it, because you often don't see records of that, you know, like what you actually had for dinner in the officer's right. quarters. So what did they um, have to eat? What, do you remember what they had to Oh, eat? there was, yeah, there was pork, there was pheasant, there was chicken, there was fish, there was... Like it was a lot of different lots of bones. lots of protein. Lots yeah. Of oh yeah, lots of protein. <laughs> <laughs> but um, and the other one that's also kind of similar, both officers as well, jumps to the after the War of eighteen twelve and Fort George becoming Camp Niagara, right? Because Fort George, you know, is, is part of Camp Niagara. And you have that slide there actually in the one that shows Camp Niagara mm-hmm. with Fort George in the background. Yeah. Uh, but um, it was a, a military site throughout. There it is, right there throughout the late 1800s into, like you said, like the 1950s. Uh, but not only during the First World War, though. And there's a building right next to there called the Junior Commissariat Officers Quarters that, uh, w- that was built around the War of 1812 time period. That's when it was constructed. And it changes multiple hands over the years, becomes civilian, it goes back to military, gets rented out again, back to military. And during the First World War, it was uh, used as an officer's club. Mm. And uh, so essentially it was like a bar, right? And what's really neat about it um, is that uh, uh, in, on the wall, carved in the wall, still to this day, is one of the drink recipes from the First World War. That's still there, that somebody wrote right, down. Right. Nice. And I believe, and one of our staff actually, he might even be on watching today, uh, tried it. <laughs> he tried to make it. I don't know how good it was. He never exactly. But, right? uh, <laughs> yeah, I always have these visions. I remember I came across a spruce yeah. beer recipe. I thought, I want to try that. I'm like, no, I probably don't. I really, I really don't like <laughs> You it probably don't, yeah. So, I'm not that so, not not that curious. Yeah. So so a lot, but there's tons of cool stories like that. You know, so interesting facts and that kind of thing. So right. So while we're on this slide, like let, let's talk, and, and we'll get back to Fort Erie in a minute. But like like following the war, like Fort George has, in, you know, just as you know, War of 1812 obviously a pinnacle, but really fascinating story afterwards. Like it just can, keeps on being utilized um, by the British, by the Canadians, and and for lots of different things. So. 
you know, you know, what happens after war, you know, the war, um, you, you talked about them re rebuilding and then, you know, what, what, what goes on on the property? For Fort George? Yeah, for Fort George, yeah. So, yeah, so for after the War of 1812, the fort itself kind of remains in ruins. They don't actually rebuild it because they start building Fort Mississauga. And then because the Welland Canal is built, there's not as much need to protect the mouth of the river because now you have a supply chain that goes around that. So they shift, like, most of their funding toward Kingston, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so Fort Mississauga starts to fall in disrepair, and Fort George like, just kind of falls apart. It's like the, by, by Camp Niagara times, the ruins are there, the wall, the, the earthen banks are still there, but there's no buildings on the inside, that kind of stuff. So the grounds of Fort George is part of much bigger military picture mm -hmm. um, in, uh, in Camp Niagara, which, like you said, is used right up to the 1950s. Um, but the funny twist is that people think of Niagara Lake now, Right, and it's this beautiful, picturesque, you know, two, two million people a year come to visit it. It's gorgeous wineries. Whereas, like, not too long ago, <laughs> not, like, it was a military far town. Distance, you know? like, yeah. like I, I, I talked to, to people that live there still and say, yeah, we were, like, when I was a young girl, I couldn't go anywhere near this part of town because that's where the yeah. soldiers hung out. And I wasn't yeah, allowed nice to Nice girls there. did not go to the Prince of Wales is what I heard. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. So, so much different picture. Um, but, you know, it wasn't until the 1930s when Fort George is rebuilt along with Fort Erie, right, that uh, it's opened as a, as a national historic site. And, um, and then we see uh, it used for, I don't know if you're going to get that later or you want me to go on that now. About sure, how it's whatever, today. it's free food, whatever. But, oh, uh, yeah. but yeah, on, so we on. used it for all kinds of things now. So for a park, for, you know, nature walks, for right. military reenactments, for concerts, for whatever. Yeah, yeah. So. yeah. Okay, so, so, so Travis, yeah. And again, Fort George gets used military and all these other things. So what happens? The siege happens, uh, um, but the American threat is over. And I guess, I guess that's, that's the other thing I have for, for you guys is like, how long does the American threat, you know, last after the War of 1812? Is Fort, you know, is Fort Erie manned for a lot longer since it's stone and sort of a bit more fortified? Or uh, well, I, I, Yeah, it, it kind of got uh, isolated after the War of 1812, but then the... Uh, Fenian raid happens, and that's where not only the fort itself, but the town's history is incorporated into the Fenian raid is when the Fenians came over and they wanted to hold Canada hostage um, to free Ireland. So they used the fort as, uh, as a landmark or like as a depot. So they crossed the river, held Fort Erie. They had a, the Battle of Ridgeway, which is in the town of Fort Erie. And that's like further past War of 1812. That's the other incorporated history that I don't think a lot of Canadians are aware mm -hmm. of. And when they come down here, they just see Battle of Ridgeway signs everywhere or right. uh, Fenian raids uh, signs everywhere. And it's one of our common questions is, what is that? Yeah, they probably assume Battle of Ridgeway is War of 1812 or something, right? They don't. Yeah, they, they don't, yeah, they don't know the connection. Yeah, yeah, 50 years later. Yeah, and they had no idea. Like uh, people from Alberta, like Manitoba, have no idea what these, uh, what the Fenian raid is. So that is uh, past the War of 1812. The fort's history is tied into that, and even the town. So, so the Fen so during the Fenian raids, was Fort Erie a uh, manned um, uh, fort still at that stage? No, no, no. Okay, no, no. okay. Goes into disuse by that. It's just sort of, but but it's still there. Like there's still enough there that they can utilize and sort of look at as. Yeah, the buildings were still here. Like in the 1860s, it, it, it looked like something that you could just take over and uh, set up shop and launch an attack from. So right, right. when the Fenians came over from Buffalo, that's exactly what they saw, right? So right. that and they used it as that. And right, right, right. They launched their attack, and yeah, um, unfortunately, yeah, obviously there was a, a battle that happened in Ridgeway, and there was people that lost their lives, and there was a fight at the down at the river, back and forth. So that history is something that like we share as well, not only to the town of Fort Erie, but always, obviously to the the rest of uh, Canada. Yeah. Okay. I, I, there, I haven't seen any questions come in through our Q and A, um, so I think I think there's a good time for us to. Just, I may just remind you that if you're following on at home, I hope you're enjoying this. Um, but if you have any questions for these two that, you know, you feel they haven't answered at this point, or you really want to get into it, uh, um, shoot off a question, throw it into the Q&A. Um, we had one there that uh, I probably wasn't doing the technical stuff well, so I hope I figured that out. 
Um, but, uh, you know, if you have some questions, throw it in there. But let's just keep on going, you know, going along on uh, the questions I've got for you guys, because, you know, I think we, we looked at this being about 45 minutes to an hour. We're, we're getting close to that. So, um, you know, what, you know, Fort Erie. So, so maybe I'll pull back up the, uh, the screen uh, on the Fort Erie picture, um, the current picture, um, either one. Is there any elements that still remain? Like, is there any, um, you know, is it total reconstruction or is there remnants? Is there a wall or what, what do we, you know, what do we have there? So our interpretation is that like the two buildings that you see in this image, uh, the foundations are original. Mm -hmm. And what you visit today is an amalgamation of British and American. So right. the, full, the full scale of what you visit today is an amalgamation of that. And right. Ronald Way, way back in the day, and like uh, Fort George has a, a similar history, is he reconstructed these places so that there was a, a timeline, a timeline. Mm -hmm. So when you travel down the Niagara Parkway, um, you would end up in 1814 at this fort in Fort mm -hmm. Erie. And right. 1812 at Fort George is where you would begin your journey. So like as a visionary like him, that was what he envisioned. Mm -hmm. And in 20, 2012, during the bicentennial, there was grant money to, uh, for us to do some renovations. So this image behind that big, huge uh, V is something that we had created to recreate what the siege of Fort Erie might've looked like in a shrunken down version of it. If you see that little snake, you pull that snake out, that's what the uh, um, the siege batteries look like right. away from the property. And you would, you would pull that snake out like even beyond the screen. And we've just shrunken that down and we tell more of 1814 and the siege uh, of Fort Erie that more uh, site specific stuff. So it gave us an, uh, uh, and it gave us something to expand off of. Right, right. Okay, so over to Fort, Fort George, I think you've got at least one building, right? That's uh, original to the, still to the site or my- uh, Yeah, yeah. My so the, um, uh, yeah, if you go back to slide two, I think is has the- yeah, Way back to the beginning. Yeah. So like, like Travis said, um, Ron Way, when he, when he built Fort George, it was uh, right there. There you go. It's, this it's little this one, this, this one here, right? Yeah. So this is the like 1802. So we, we are constructed for like a pre-war fort and our interpretation at Fort George is as such. So the uniforms that we wear are often just prior to the war breaking out or just early war, right? Cause um, the, the, as the war goes on, uniforms change and things change. Right. So um uh, the buildings themselves, like I said, aside from the four little cluster of buildings uh, in the under the right next to the word George in the middle of the screen, uh, everything else is there, but they're all reconstruction. Um, the only building that remains is the very back, uh, the left on the screen, I guess, would be the small building uh, back there, which is the powder magazine. Right. Uh, so it's the it's the only building that survived, which is currently actually as we speak right now under construction to um, fix it up to restore it. So a new roof is being put on it, and they're repointing some of the um, uh, buttresses that come out. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's the only one that remains, and we believe it's the oldest military building in Ontario. I think is what uh, what it's been been dubbed as. So so yeah. So unfortunately, the most of the fort is reconstructed. Um, uh, and uh, one thing we kind of regret, and we, we appreciate Ron Way doing this and making it like look exactly what he did in 1802, but in doing so, he tore down the, uh, the wall that still existed that ran through the middle of the fort, which is the American edition. So although it does look the way it did in 1802, it would have been really interesting to see the remnants of that wall still there, right? But unfortunately, in the 1930s, they essentially wanted to make it the original, so they bulldozed it down. Right. So, so okay, so... When, the, the, I think you've sort of answered this a little bit, maybe there's not much more to go on. So what time period are we looking at uh, recognizing these as National Historic Sites and looking at this reconstruction? When, you know, when is it, when, what, what, what era was that going about? Either one of you guys. Well, it's late 19, the late 1930s is when things start. Right. It's, it's, a, it's a part of a make work project for the depression through right. the sites. And then, you know, it's the, um, the push from communities and, and locals that, that designated a national historic site, just because it's, it's uh, rebuilt doesn't mean it's a historic site, as you know, right? Like you can, mm -hmm. 
anything can be dubbed a national historic site, you know, provided it has- Human castles from England have dropped them here and they're still historic sites, but- Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but, you know, so, uh, so yeah, so it's, it's the night, late 1930s into the 1940s that, that they're rebuilt and then open to the public. Right, right, right. That's, and that's pretty much the 40 restore too, right? Yeah. Same, it's a depression era, make work um, uh, way of sort of uh, getting people working and, and moving and, and, and thank goodness they did, right? You know, again, yeah. we've got two beautiful sites and, it, and again, uh, you know, we, we sometimes are critical of those who come before us in our fields, but I think by and large, I think, I think you know, Ray, uh, it's Ray, right? It's uh, did a pretty good job of sort of um, giving us something that you guys can work with. Obviously, there's probably mistakes, right? There, there's things that yeah. happen, but, uh, but by and large, I think he's done a great job to sort of allow us to sort of tell these stories. And, well, it's Correct really, me if I'm wrong. Well, he gave us jobs, right? <laughs> <laughs> True. But the interesting thing is that they, the reconstructions, because they're now almost 100-year-old themselves, are their own historic site. Yeah. Right. Right. The right. reconstruction right. itself is a hundred year old reconstruction. Right. right. So it's and like, it tells a story about an era. And again, you know, again, I was talking about monuments and memorials and all that yeah. quite often the, 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 the building, and this is essentially a memorial in many ways, yeah. you know, these forts are memorials and they tell us something about the era that they're built in. Mm -hmm. um, so it was really neat. And, and you, one of the questions I was going to ask that I didn't sort of you know, prep you guys ahead of time, but you meant, you know, Travis mentioned about, you know, giving us jobs and all that. And, and allowing you to sort of go around and talk to people and tell people his great stories. Um, what's the best part of working on the fort? Travis, start with you. <laughs> uh, I, I literally wanted to share this story, uh, this entire uh, broadcast. <laughs> so for the viewers that are out there that are still with us, uh, Pete actually is the one that hired me. Uh, <laughs> Pete is the one that actually hired me at Fort Erie way back at way back when. So he is, I, I consider him one of my mentors, and <laughs> one of the people that I admire and go to for advice for everything. Um, working, I, I'm working at a fort, it's just <laughs> literally, yeah, I don't think your head can get any bigger. <laughs> <laughs> I'm literally working at a fort, sharing history is one of the things that I literally enjoy sharing indigenous history, doing and talking to families and the expressions off of families is something that like, is the reason why I'm still sitting here. Right. Right. Pete, you got anything else to add to that? Yeah, um, I, I just, I, I think history is fascinating myself. Um, and, you know, we often hear that you know, history is boring. Right, and you heard you, I, in school, I, I, you know, I get this all the time. Well, I, I took history in school, but it was just so boring, I didn't pay attention, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I like that when someone comes into the fort expecting to be bored, mm -hmm. uh, whether it's a member, a family member, and walk out like, you know. Yeah, because you've got a group of five, and you know one yeah, or two just one don't person's there. there to see the don't fort. Don't want to be there, yeah. Exactly, right? So like, you know, I remember, I came around, I think I did a World War One event and, uh, you know, as, as a young, uh, this young kid, I think he was probably like six years old or seven, was walking out. He was just said, uh, you know, that was cool. You're going to think, right, he just, he just loved it. Every part of it. That was so cool. And, you know, I, I said, that's why I do this. You know, I'm like, done, check, mm -hmm. you know. Right, you know, right, you know? right. But, uh, yeah. but yeah, no, it just, it's like, it's, it's the, the enjoyment of taking something that is important, you know, and, uh, and relaying that information to people in a way that they find fascinating. Right. And uh, when you, when you get that engagement with someone that is is just uh, you know they just they will say thank you so much this was so great you know and that's that's why I do it you know because yeah. it's fun you know yeah. I love that yeah. and uh, Trav was a great Trav was a great employee back mm -hmm. in the day let me tell you <laughs> <laughs> um, okay uh, last one, uh, and actually we've got at least one question in so I'll get sure. I'll get to that in a minute but um, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about you know your sites. Um, Pete, maybe start with you. Fort George is open right now. Um, yes. So how, um, how are you operating? You know, yeah. if people want to come visit you. Well, obviously this year is different and unique uh, because of, of COVID-19 and, and the challenges that come along with that. So um, normally we're open seven days a week from May until August and then, well, actually until November, really. Um, when we have a fight for drum corps and cannons and muskets and the whole shebang and events. Unfortunately, because of, of the re restrictions uh, and the concerns of COVID-19, we're not running as much. Mm -hmm. So um, this is actually our last week where we're open four days a week uh, to the public. 
uh, starting after this weekend, we're open on weekends only from 12 to four, but you can book a, um, uh, I believe it's on Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, but check the website because I'm changing this week. You can book a private tour at no additional fee, which is a great way to see nice. Fort George. Like you can go in, get a full private, the entire fort's yours with a guy. time limit or just- I think, it's just... Like an, I think it's an hour, I think okay, it is, okay. right? But you know, you get a private tour where it's just you, your family or your group, whoever that is, right? Mm -hmm. It's by group, right? It's not by, like we don't say, okay, 30 people. No, it's if you and your family got family five, it's your fort for an hour kind of thing, nice. right? Nice. So, um, uh, so that's what we're offering right now. And then of course in the winter, um, uh, we, we're closing, I think as of January, we're, we're just closing down, okay. but we're weekends only at this point, 12 to four. I think that we might shift in the winter, but our website, I'll, I'll give you the more oh, information. Yeah. Everybody's but, shifting so quickly. So I, I know yeah, anybody are, at home, anybody at home, check our, a website, check social media. I know. To see what, what's going on. We are having our first event, believe it or not. Normally we have like 30 events a year and we had mm -hmm. zero but we're having a COVID friendly event, hopefully, uh, check our website in uh, October. Uh, we're looking at October 2nd for a, uh, uh, a revamping of our very popular murder mystery that may happen, our period murder mystery at right, Fort George. Right. Which is smaller um, ticket numbers so you can spread out. And yes, yes, right it's now. gonna be done quite differently than if you've been mm -hmm. there in the past. It'll be a little different, it's not as free flowing. Mm -hmm. It's more of a tour kind of thing that in a mm -hmm. mystery you have to solve in small groups of uh, like 10. And with, so we get here to social distancing and that kind of stuff. So, uh, but yeah, keep your eye out for that. Great. So start. Travis, so Travis Fort Erie, you guys are open as well. You're doing tours. So what's the lay of land down there? Yeah. If you want to learn so much more cooler history, <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're only, we're open. We, uh, we close after this weekend, we close on Monday after Labor Day. So you got a small, a small, uh, small amount, window. A small window. Come visit us. We do tours every hour, starting at ten o'clock. Our last tour is at three o'clock. We do musket demonstrations, and if you want to learn so much more history about the Niagara region, uh, come down to our place. <laughs> okay, so I've got a question actually, and it's for for Peter, and it's from from Vermont. So hello from Vermont. Thanks for joining us. Oh. Um, he has two questions, but, but he says uh, that we answered one of them in a follow-up. Um, the, the, the question he's got is, years ago when I visited Fort George, I remember the building as being unfinished wood. The last yes. time I, I visited, it was painted. Yeah. It seems to show up painted. Any idea of originality and, and sort of the story behind that? Yeah, when they re that's an excellent question. Uh, when they rebuilt it, they kept it raw wood when they first rebuilt it. Um, but from the, the, the images and the, and the accounts that we have, that really wasn't the way. Um, and uh, I can't answer to you right now exactly why they left it finished to start. I'm not too sure if it was um, just time and they just didn't have time to finish it or they wanted to make it look kind of, or they didn't know that's how it's supposed to look. But um, the officer's quarters was yellow and sided. The buildings were sided. Um, and gray was the typical color of a barrack back then. And from the Walsh print, as we can see that when he was here in, mm -hmm in uh, in 1803 era um that that's what the fort looked like so we have one building that's still uh actually no we have two buildings that are still raw unfinished wood on the outside uh and the reason why we left them that way is to pay homage to the reconstruction itself right so uh the fort with the exception of those two buildings look pretty much the way it did in 1802 now and we just actually finished um, reciting all the blockhouses. It literally, it's like finishing this week, <laughs> I think, right? <laughs> so it looks great now, um, but, uh, but that's, that's the question. Yeah, originally they, when they rebuilt it, it was all unfinished wood, but historically uh, they were sided, they were painted. Uh, and the paint that we have on there now is, is as close as we think we can get to what it originally looked like. Right. Fort Erie's got a stone fort, so. <laughs> It's stone color. It looks like stone. That's what it is. And much stronger. <laughs> stronger yeah, so. one third the size. <laughs> I tell you, I tell you, size is one. <laughs> anyway, guys, there. not touching not that. going there. We're not we, going there. We, anyway, we, we all love our jobs at our sites, <laughs> and uh, we want to keep it that way. Um, thanks very much, guys. Uh, there's no other questions coming in, and if there was Facebook questions, I apologize. Uh, I just didn't get a chance to look at them. Um, for those of you following at home on Zoom, um, this will be posted on our YouTube channel as well, so you can watch it again. We had someone ask to sort of be able to see it again. Uh, we'll post to YouTube. Um, but I want to thank you too, Peter and Travis. You guys were great. Um, 
uh, I knew it would sort of be a great little chat and, and, and way to look at it. And whether, you know, wood versus stone, large versus small, you know, a view of Youngstown versus Buffalo, you know, it depends on when you're looking at it, might be uh, better at different times. So, you know, it, it, it was great to sort of have this chat and sort of understand it a little bit more. And, and like I said, I've learned, you know, a, a lot about Fort Erie because again, like I said, I've, you know, I, I, I'm a Northern Niagara guy and I, I sometimes don't go south of that well in a Niagara Falls border enough. Um, but, uh, you know, I did drag my family out there. I was one of those families, right? I dragged my family out there one Father's Day and say, that's what we're doing. I get the choice today. So uh, I did visit Travis down there a couple years ago. But uh, um, thanks a lot, guys. Uh, again, there's probably way more we can go into it. Maybe we'll talk about, um, you know, starting this up even, you know, I, I, you know if, if we still are in this period and doing these things and uh, might be something else. I just actually saw someone else come in. Oh. Oh, somebody's just thanking us. Sorry, I, I got <laughs> sidetracked by you know bottles and whistles, but someone's thanking Woo. us on the uh, question Q and A. So, so again, thank you, Peter. Thank you, Travis. Thank you for. And again, this was a bit last minute, folks at home. Uh, um, Peter had to get the uh, the queen to sign off on him joining. <laughs> Travis just sort of had to ask our neighbor over here at the museum in Niagara Falls to, to help out. But uh, I'm glad both of you joined us and uh, and have a great time. I hope everybody had a good time at home. Like I said, follow us on Facebook, follow our YouTube, and we've got lots of other things coming up. So thanks a lot and have a great night. Thank you so much, Clark. Thanks, Take Clark. Care. Bye.